here is basically uh, focused a little bit more on the study impact study of the uh, hams. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes uh, over there. So um, first, I want to talk about the background of this uh, research. So this research is basically joint effort between the our university, Kansas State University, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and also the Department of Energy. So we have the joint project looking into this, uh, you know, with high penetration of the photovoltaics and the EV and stuff over there, what's the impact of that into the system? So basically the US Department of Energy, the Solar Energy Technology Office is working towards a levelized cost. The, the basically goal is basically the two cents per kilowatt hour for utility scale solar and four cents for this commercial PV and five cents for this residential top uh, rooftop PV system. So this is our 2030 goals for this uh, nationwide. So. As you can see, right now we're at about this like two and three uh, times, two, about two times of this uh, uh, cost, uh, you know, go over there. So over time, over the next 10 years, or eight, eight years or something, hopefully we can achieve that five, four and two cents per, you know, kilowatt hour for this uh, PV system over there. So another thing is that, uh, you know, the in September 2021, the DOE released the solar future study, which is a report that explored the role of solar energy in transitioning to a carbon-free electrical grid. So this is basically the show that uh, the study find that with aggressive cost re re reduction here and supportive policies and large scale electrification, solar could account for as much as 40% of the national electricity supply by 2035 and 45 by 2050. So you can see nearly half of this uh, generosity, uh, generation should be come from the solar in, by 2050. So. We also estimate that the solar capacity would need to reach about 1,600 gigawatt to achieve a zero carbon you know, grid with enhanced electrification of end users, such as motor vehicles and building space and water heating. And also preliminary model shows us that the decarbonization of the entire US energy system could result in as much as 3,200 gigawatt of solar due to this uh, increased electrification of buildings and electrical vehicles and also industrial energy and production and such. So this is uh, kind of our goals for this uh, solar. So this is uh, you know, our background, uh, why important to distribute energy resources in the future distribution system. So that's why we focus a little bit more on the solar parts in this study. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is that electrical vehicle. I think electrical vehicle, you know, both in China and the United States are kind of advancing very fast. So on August 20, uh, you know, August 9, 2021, the Bloomberg projected that at least two thirds of global car sales will be electrical cars by 2040. And also passenger EV sales are projected to increase sharply, rising about 3 million in 2020 to 66 million in 2040. So that's going to be sharp increase in the next uh, 18 years or so. And also electrification of vehicles is an important alternative for the reduction of greenhouse gases emission, fossil fuel consumption, and also EV offers numerous advantages over traditional vehicles with internal combustion engine, including lower operating cost, higher potential for utilizing local generation, and also large deployment of EVs in foreseeable future will pose major issues for the power grid as we a part of research, uh, you know, engineer, we know that a lot of issues associated with EV, especially, uh, you know, uh, we have large kind of the, you know, uh, simultaneous peak in there. So what should we do about this kind of charging at the same time? So those are things basically we, we keeping, uh, you know, in our uh, study. And also I want to have a specific example. The example is in California. In California, or about right now, it's like 2021, one year ago, it's about 12.5% of the new light duty vehicle registration was plug-in electrical vehicles. If you're driving the California highway, you can see a lot of Teslas and other basically electrical vehicles in over there. About like 12.5% is already not right now, it's an electrical vehicle. Also the next highest were with the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Washington, Oregon. The, those are about 7% of the new registration are about this uh, electrical vehicles. And also, uh, one thing just we are writing, uh, right now we're doing is that this kind of EV charging right now is still unmanaged charging. Unmanaged charging is basically whenever you go to your home or something, just plug in and then your charge is not smart over there. So unmanaged EV charging can stress the existing grid infrastructure, possibly leading to operational reliability and planning issues 
both at the bulk and distribution systems. So as we know that distribution system and transmission system may have a you know, huge impact because of the large penetration of EVs. So in contrast, you know, uh, basically average the charging can support, you know, managed charging can support the power system planning operation during normal and extreme events. So which can benefit the PV owners and other electricity you know, stakeholders in here. So as you can see, the number showing this figure show that, you know, we, if we have managed charging, we can reduce the bulk system investment cost a lot and then reduce bulk system operating cost, reduce renewable energy curtailment and reduce distribution system investment and increase the distribution system EV hosting capacity about those specific numbers. So those are from this uh, specific study we found online. So this is, um, you know, important reference from Department of Energy we refer. And also, if we have this, uh, you know, 2.5 million, you know, electric vehicle we adopted to the system, so smart charging of the, all the vehicles can avoid for 50 percent of the incremental system operating cost and reduce renewable energy curtailment by 27 percent, as you can see from this, uh, basically the, the figures over here annually, especially regarding to this charging of the same number of EVs in the left. You can see left here is unmanaged with the figure, and right here is basically that managed over there. So you, you can see that, uh, you know, significant differences if we have this uh, charging discharged, uh, you know, managed and unmanaged kind of charging over there. So this is a still a significant motivation of our, uh, you know, study in this uh, uh, work. And also, as we mentioned before, most of the light duty EVs will be charged in a residential homes and a residential homes also equipped with the rooftop PVs. In this case, a home energy management system, basically it's kind of like the, you know, the energy battery or energy hub for your home is one of the most effective tools to implement the smart charging as well as optimally dispatch the, you know, solar energies and also to monitor the energy usage and smart appliances and subsequent sending the control command to each the appliances for energy cost saving and peak load reduction. So those are things basically highly motivated the research community and also in the industry, people are looking into develop the home energy management system. So we have this um, study have been a couple of years starting a uh, trace back. So we have been work, still working on this area, but important to question, you know, in the academia is looking to how to deal with uncertainty. Okay, so we have a lot of uncertainties for the us user behaviors, for this weather forecasting, and also, you know, other stuff, driving pattern like EV or something like that. How to deal with uncertainty is kind of important uh, question for HAM study. Uh, the research question we're looking to specifically here is how the future proliferation of HAMS would affect the distribution system with PV and EVs? Those is important questions. So what uh, happens if 50% or 60% of uh, HAMS would be in our home uh, in the distribution system? So how the all the DERs is gonna impact our, you know, the distribution system. So that's important kind of, uh, uh, you know, questions we want to uh, answer in this um, study over there. So uh, in this case, our work aims to fill the gap by using a stochastic, basically that we consider uncertainty, stochastic HAMS within model predictive control uh, framework to demonstrate the potential impact. Actually we, want, actually, we want to quantify the impact of HAMS in the large scale distribution system. So basically, um, this is our, you know, the conceptual diagram of the individual HAMS. You can see this is actually as a brain of this uh, home energy. Basically, everything can be directly, you know, dispatched or controlled, you know, in this HAMS. And the HAMS will take the weather information, weather forecasting from online and take all this kind of a price information from the utility or if can dynamic pricing or other stuff there, they can make the optimal decision, optimal scheduling for the household to save the energy, to satisfy your uh, thermal comfort and to all sorts of things depending on your object function. So in this case, we look into uh, developing a stochastic HAMS and also looking into the model predictive control framework to, uh, you, know, um, you know, to implement the HAMS uh, you know, in the home. So that's the idea for that. Uh, a specific part I want to mention is that in this home, we also focus looking into the PV and the EV. So PV and EV are important parts. So as I mentioned before, so how the HAMS can dispatch the PV and EV together to reach this, you know, the achieve the highest uh, efficiency for the home owners. 
So this is the individual hams we showed right here. The next slide, I want to show the conceptual diagram of the distribution system, which is illustrated in here. As you can see, this is basically a you know, hybrid three-phase and uh, you know, uh, single-phase distribution system. So the left-hand side shows the basically one line diagram. So if you look at the right-hand side, we have the step-down transformers, and then we have this kind of a, you know, goes to the laterals. So we have this, uh, you know, three-phase and then, you know, single-phase, you know, the system clear. You can see the right heart, right part has the uh, three-phase system, which every phase we have the hams, multiple hams, multiple homes over there for phase A, B, and C. And also we have some single phase kind of uh, here, single phase you can see in the, in the bottom part, in the middle bottom part of the hams, which is only deducted to sing, uh, a specific phase. For example, in here is phase two of the system. So in this case, we have a hybrid, basically three phase and single phase system in the distribution system in here. So our idea is to use extensive simulation, which is linking the HAMS with a quasi steady state time series QST simulation tool, and to look into the high, your large scale. Basically, in this case, we have 8,500 uh, uh, node distributing feeder with 1,000 or close to 2,000 smart homes with diverse comfort settings. So how in this um, scenario, HAMS with all the technologies can uh, you know, perform in the system. So how, what's the impact of this HAMS in the system as well? So the real-time communication to weather and energy price forecast could enable the HAMS to make the optimal decision, optimal dispatch uh, in our uh, simulation framework. Another thing I just want to briefly mention in this paper, because I, I just want to pre present this paper, we have a lot of other, you know, uh, similar uh, other work in this HAMS area. This contribution of this work is basically we incorporate stochastic HAMS into the high fidelity residential home model. We propose a co-simulation framework. So based on the QSTS simulation tool and also the HAMS, we also evaluate the impact of HAMS managing EVs and the battery energy storage system and air conditioners and water heater in the presence of PV. So a lot of things basically can be uh, like comes into, uh, you know, we can get a closer look at those stuff under the simulation uh, framework here. HAMS model. HAMS model, I want to briefly talk about this mathematical model. This is uh, actually... Uh, something like uh, quite uh, well adopted or it's not quite that novel actually in my mind that for this study. So our study focus is more on this impact study. So, uh, the, you know, for example, the common, you know, constraint, common objective function for the HAMS will be the thermal uh, discomfort of the end user. So this incorporate this uh, residential customers. So in this study, we use a linear penalized function for this temperature deviation between the predicted value and the customer desired temperature. This is still very kind of a rough model. I know most of researchers prefer this use PMV model. So we um, also have that work in our lab. So just didn't do that for this large scale study. So this is the one part, thermal discomfort. We have to take care of the people's kind of thermal comfort. That's what the first thing. The second thing would be, of course, the energy cost. We want to lower the energy cost. We want to basically uh, uh, dispatch a battery and then stuff like that to uh, lower the cost. But the battery degradation has to be considered over there because this is a kind of a, you know very uh, necessary parts for this energy uh, storage. And also what if we have the time-based pricing scheme, like the uh, time of use scheme over there. So what's the impact over there for this total energy cost? Anyway, we want to minimize energy cost for that, for this uh, model. And briefly that this is, uh, we use this, uh, you know, two component. We form a, you know, single object function optimization problems so using the weighted uh, method over there. So we get some a heuristic method to get the maximum value of this uh, thermal comfort and max value of the energy cost. In this case, we can normalize the two terms and then put uh, alpha one, R two in here to adjust the preference of the you know customers customer can say i just want to minimize our cost 90 percent 10 percent i will take care of our discomfort or something like that so those are things can be uh, specified by the users in uh, reality reality this kind of a, we can have a survey to the customers the customer can you know answer the question so we can determine the alpha one or two for the customers over there so this is already done in our lab uh, in our joint effort and also you can say we have something like the uh, you know because we want to keep this uh, flexibility, keep the hams to be feasible. So we have some penalty terms in this uh, to the function. Of course, we want to uh, minimize those penalty as well. So hams constraint, briefly mentioned that hams constraint, we include in this home energy uh, power balance constraint. The idea would be the energy generated locally and energy extracted from the grid 
you know, should be balanced, you know, in this case. So we have the, should we satisfy, you know, our, all the appliances over there. So those are things basically uh, quite, this, you know, uh, conventional for this hand, HEMS model. And also the, you know, HVAC system, HVAC system, we use a first order linear thermodynamic model. So one C, one R, one C model here. I think that's uh, for the simplicity of the model, because we're going to use this optimization for the larger system, thousands of homes over there. So we want to have a faster execution time. So we use the first order linear thermal model. And all this, you know, you can see from this bottom, you know, uh, expression, uh, the equation here, we have a lot of uh, parameters associated with this um, Indoor temperature, social with the HVAC system, social with the solar irradiance, social with also temperature. So those those basically the terms can be uh, obtained from this uh, machine learning method or kind of a, a regression method based on realistic uh, data of our house. So in this case, we have you know uh, ten years of data for the specific house. So all this weather forecast over there. So in this case, we can have a basically uh, some linear regression to get the you know co uh, co uh, coefficient for the terms over there. So water heater, water heater is another basically big uh, you know energy consumer for the residential home. So we have a similar basic water heater model. So again, it's first uh, one R one C model for the water heater, and also we have battery constraints. Battery constraint, I think, is this basic standard uh, you know charge discharge and right. So that's a uh, state of charge. Uh, the dynamics changes. And also the important part, I think this uh, work to differentiate itself from others is the battery degradation cost. We consider a battery degradation as a cost. So this is basically the battery degradation cost can estimate both the energy uh, capacity fade and power fade, and they include the effect causing by temperature, average SOC, depths of discharge, and all the stuff we can have some cost terms if uh, like in dollars associated with that. So this terms, as you see in the bottom of the, you know, the slides here, it was added into the objective function in the energy cost over there. We want to also minimize battery degradation cost. So in this case, we can have maybe longer battery, uh, you know, uh, higher battery efficiency, uh, you know, over time. So this is also important uh, consideration in this work. So the next one would be uncertainty representation. So uh, I think this is uh, you know a lot of uh, research in the researcher in the academia has been looking to. So we have the stochastic optimization, robust optimization, different uh, you know chance constraint stuff like that over there. So in this study, we didn't focus uh, specifically on this uh, uncertainty representation. So we use old method basically. So we use the stochastic so like a Monte Carlo simulation over there. We consider outdoor temperature, PV generation, hot water usage, non-controllable load. All this four, uh, you know, component can have the uncertainty over there. So in this case, how we generate scenarios, each scenario will kind of have four dimension of each of these uncertainty parts. And also, we in this case we uh, use the normal distribution. We use the auto regressive moving average. As you can see, as time goes by, the forecast will be less accurate over time. So we use this kind of a simplistic, uh, you know, uncertainty representation in this work. And also we use scenario reduction techniques. And this is a very commonly seen in the stochastic study over there. So again, so this framework can be applied to many, many different uh, uncertainty representation as long, as long as you have the scenarios. So I just want to see the, uh, uh, you know, our model can be widely adopted into other models, especially for the uncertainty models. Next one will be the model predictive control. So this is, uh, I think everybody has been know this very well. So MPC is a method of process control while satisfying the set of constraints. So we have this, you know, steps, unit initialization, and, uh, you know, doing this kind of uh, estimation, uh, reduce scenarios and starting kind of a running hams. Once hams get results, return the first uh, time period to this uh, simulator, and then we get as a new state of the simulator to the hams to make the next decision. So this is gonna be, have a, you know, go on, go on for this next, uh, you know, uh, scheduling horizon. As we know that the forecast error mitigation MPC already have this mechanism because they just use the recent uh, uh, forecast. So in this case, forecast can be updated over the air. And also the algorithm has stochastic, uh, you know, uncertainty representation. So in two, for the, for, uh, two aspects, I think this uncertainty can be addressed. One by stochastic, the other one by model predictive control by updating this forecast very frequently over there. 
And this figure demonstrates this uh, QSTA simulation flow chart for a single house. As you can see, this is uh, the, uh, you know, for single house, uh, you know, uh, implementation, we have a multiple house later on, we'll talk about that. So QSTA simulation, so it's basically, we couple the HAMS with the Green Lab D. I think Green Lab D is, uh, you know, DOE has been promoting this one a lot on this uh, simulation tools. And also Green Lab D is a power distribution system simulation tool developed by PNL. So it performs the QSTS simulation of distributed feeders in homes and use agent-based method to simulate end use loads, such as appliances, heating and cooling system. And also, uh, you know, BlabD can also provide retail market modeling tool, including price responsible and end use loads. This figure shows our implementation. I think that's uh, kind of the standard structure over there. And also the BlabD is an agent-based method. Now, if it comes to this uh, more interesting part will be a large number of homes. If we have thousands of homes in this case, so what should we do? So we leverage the Unreal work, with Unreal's like IESM, which is Integrated Energy System Modeling uh, Simulation Framework. So in this framework, we have incorporated over 2000 uh, HAMS in the system. So you can see the IES integrated the simulated distributed feeders. You can see the feeders, uh, the diagram in the bottom of this uh, right-hand side figure. So this is about uh, you know, 8,500 uh, feeders, uh, the very high level of the, of the abstraction over there. So these feeders have the PV and battery energy storage and the EV, and also the feeder has buildings. Okay, so this can all be applied for, by IESM. Our HAMS is gonna be embedded in the system and the different market is, uh, tariff and structure through the co-simulation. So we can achieve a lot of uh, uh, basically the functionalities over there, looking at the different uh, impact of the system, uh, it, the impact of this HAMS to the system. So this is the, the uh, I think the unique parts of this work is the large scale IESM kind of a co-simulation framework over there. Now I want to briefly uh, present the simulation work. This is actually work, uh, Maybe it looks like a little bit kind of a, a high level, but uh, we spend a lot of time, especially a couple of Unreal researchers at Unreal, and uh, we have uh, people here working here. So we have uh, working at one year, one year and a half, looking into different case studies uh, over there. So the first case study we're looking to is the single house. Okay, single house in this case, we, if we have one single house, how HAMS is gonna operate. In this case, the single house optimization does not look into the Great impact study. So this is just want to briefly mention that. So the HAMS optimizes the uh, cooling set points for conditioner, EV charging rate, and the heating rate, heating set point of the water heater, and the thermal uh, envelopes and of the house, air conditioner, EV, and water heater are modeled explicitly in the gray lab D. And no non-controllable loads are uh, represented by the zip load and also the equal uh, weights are placed in the operating function for 30% of energy. 30% of thermal discomfort. So the results, the first results I want to show is that the first tariff is that ETOUB plant, which is the um, used by Pacific Gas and Electrical Company. The simulation runs for a 24 hour period with one minute granularity. The HAMS basically optimized was, you know, every 50 minutes using a 24 hours time horizon. The shaded area, as we can see, the pink area on this um, diagram shows the you know the peak uh, price price uh, over there. So you can see other times has a lower price. The pink area has basically higher uh, price over there. Figure nine shows this um, Hams, how Hams is working for this um, home. You can see. Uh, basically, Hams make decisions at the beginning. The uh, the HVAC power consumption solved by Hams is shown in the green. As I show, you can see the Hams propose per cool the before the price picking, and follow customers' basic desired room temperature, as well as you know the temperature is you know within the band here. You can see that we have a band, which is the the light blue. So we want to keep the temperature within the, the band. So that's what the HAMS is doing. And also while we keep that in band, we want to minimize the cost. You can see the HAMS basically pre-cool this house, especially from, you know, uh, right before the peak and trying to save some energy after the, you know, when the peak comes. This is basically the idea for the first uh, HVAC uh, simulation. 
the, the second one is also looking to um, this comparison with or without hams. You can see this one we have with hams, which is the uh, air temperature in the in the blue, uh, solid blue. And also the air temperature without hams is, is the dotted blue. So I think maybe it's not very clear here. So the, so the core ideas we have here uh, is that use hams here is the hams can increase the air conditioner power before the peak price. Okay, still the pre-cooling, you can see around 1500 hours here. The hams optimization is basically use a lot of power, basically bring down the, 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 you know, the temperature. So in this case, we can save some energy during the peak time period. So you can see that with uh, how hams or without hams, we can see the significant difference in terms of the home uh, you know, temperature. Again, this is basically to save the cost as well as maybe uh, take care of the, the customer's uh, thermal comfort over there. So this is the, the parts. I want to also talk about this EV charging parts. EV charging parts, this figure depicts the SOC of the EV with and without HAMS. The initial SOC was set to 50%. Without the HAMS, the EV battery is charging during the peak hours. You can see that uh, if we have as you know the dumb charging right now, so whenever we just arrive and uh, plug in here, we can see the dotted is, uh, you know the blue line is without hams. It's going to write <clears throat> starting you know charging the the car. Okay, so this, this is the one part it's over there. However, if we use this um, uh, hams here, you can see we this part so we just uh, you know the hams which is slow line we wait until the last. You can see this is if we departure at six thirty or some time we departure. So the hams is actually wait until six o'clock ish, or uh, I think maybe it's not six o'clock ish or something, uh, to start charging the, the the battery. So in this case, our idea is that if we look at this kind of a degradation model, the degradation model is actually indicate us to delay our charge, delay charging, and basically, uh, you know, in long this lifetime of the battery can reduce energy uh, the battery degradation cost. So that's basically the idea we have. If we have a, a smart charging here, we're not going to charge during this uh, <clears throat> during this, uh, you know peak time. We're going to charge until the departure time. Departure time we start really fully charging that. In this case, we no longer uh, we not only basically reduce the cost, but also uh, you know uh, increase the lifetime of the battery. So that's another thing, basically, uh, for the simulation results. So this is uh, similar things. We're looking to the seven day simulation. The left hand side basically looking to uh, one tariff. Okay, the lower hand side looking to the other tariff. We use ETOUB and TOUE6. Both are from PGNE, basically the uh, you know tariff over here. You can see the left hand side has only one peak, and then the right hand side has a peak and shoulder price over there. So those are things basically we use different you know the uh, tariff to simulate. Still, we see that something like the you know pre cooling stuff over there for the hands, hands optimization over there. I want to focus a bit more on this simulation results on the large distribution system. Okay, so in this case, we have 8,500 nodes, which is the, uh, you know, this is a, a kind of a standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, test feeders, which is for the transactive energy modeling and simulation challenge, which is run by the National Institute for Standard and Technology. And all the feeders have about uh, 1,977 homes, from those kind of system. And all the homes has air conditioner, okay, but only about 1,013 of them have the electric water heater. So this is the part, so we just uh, mix and match stuff uh, to represent a real, realistic kind of a scenario. In this case, we're looking 25% of rooftop PV penetration, 2% battery energy storage penetration, 20% of hands penetration, and also the typical weather data. This is basically specific. We get the data from utility from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So those are, we're using those, uh, 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 you know, tariff and uh, <clears throat> the, the data from there and to look into the uh, study over there. So uh, this one shows the large system kind of simulation. You can see the top one shows the outside temperature. This is also have down, uh, this is five days or, or six, uh, four days actually. The, the data here is that the top one is the outdoor temperature. The middle one is basically that uh, the solar uh, uh, insulation. The bottom one is the time of use rates. So you can see we still have one peak 
uh, during the in a specific day. Okay, so that's the uh, you can see the uh, in Arizona the weather was pretty good. You can see the the it's close to the perfect sun condition. So only a little bit kind of uh, you know disturbance in the second day. So the other days looks pretty kind of the perfect you know the forecasting of the solar radiation over there. Okay. So this figure shows the comparison of total lead power of the only the homes that coupled with hams in the price responsive or control scenario. So we have two scenarios. One scenario is controlled, which means we have hams. Another scenario is not controlled, which is basic line. Basic line is not uh, without any hams. So in this case, we have two scenarios to look into controlled with hams and uh, uh, you know uncontrolled baseline without hams. This figure 15, 15 shows that this basically the power, total net power of the homes with the hams. So without hams, we didn't plot for here, but we'll do that later. This is only shows for hams, uh, homes with and without, with is the, you know, uh, uh, blue line, without is the, you know, the orange line over there, you can see there's slightly changes, right? You can see the power shift basically over time. One thing, I just the interesting thing, I just mentioned that the third day, you can see there's a lot of power oscillation right before this kind of the uh, the peak time. So you can see the peak has a very high peak up over there. So you can see and that's a uh, very interesting phenomenon. If we use hams over there, actually every household with the, the appliance or stuff, they were trying to, especially for the HVAC system, they would turn on the HVAC system in a specific you know time period right before the peak. This is gonna create issues actually for the system. So this is the thing. So we're gonna talk about more later on. So the right hand side, figure sixteen, shows the comparison of the net power of all homes. You can see left hand side shows this only uh, power with hams. Right hand side shows all the houses uh, with or without hams together. You can see they're slightly different, but still you can see the the blue line, the hams starting kind of a. Uh, gradually a little bit kind of, uh, you know, shaping the, the, the load over there. Even the penetration level is not significant. We can say still kind of uh, uh, differences with uh, with the hams for the whole distributed figures over there. Oh, sorry. So this one is basically showing the, the net power differences. Okay, so we use this one to show uh, the power differences between those uh, two scenarios, okay. The differences in net power, which is calculated by subtracting the power for houses, use hamses from the power for houses without hams. So we just want to, you know, have the similar homes and compare with one with one without hams. For each day, are showing the light blue. So you can see light blue color. The, there's oscillation here. Light blue show this basically each day difference. Also, we have the the solid blue or darker blue. Darker blue show this kind of a Average, you know, during those all simulation days, in the dark blue. So you, if we look at this one, we can see the light blue shows basically every day oscillation. The dark blue shows the average. We look and look into the average to see, you know, how the uh, simulation, you know, the, all the days the system is performing. Okay, as you can see for the control scenario, the net power increases just before the peak prices. You can see here, you know, before the peak prices. And then this because the hams pre cools the air and preheated the water to avoid the, the peak and to save a cost. And the net power is decreasing during the peak price period. This is uh, especially at the beginning of the peak. You can see this is oscillation right before very high, right into this peak time period is going to be very low. You can see the R large oscillation from high to low in the grid in the system. Okay. The daily, uh, daily net power profile of the how home couple with hams in the control scenario have more variability and higher rates of change of power in the control scenario and in the baseline, which is much more of this uh, demanding electricity uh, utility. So in this case, utility will not say this is good because of the large isolation over here. Okay, If we compare this diagram with the previous one, the difference is uh, less pronounced because only 20% of homes are coupled with hams. So this is only 20% not a significant. And also the priority is given to homes with BEE, better energy storage and the electrical vehicle uh, with this electrical water heater. So in this case, the uh, lower percentage of hands will not just uh, change a lot of uh, you know, the things for the whole uh, uh, distributed system for that. And also I want to show this uh, total power for the con uh, controllable devices. We have a this uh, you know battery, air conditioner, water heater, and the PV system output, which is average all the simulation days. You can see we have different appliances showing here, 
and then you know have top and the you know button. The top one shows the controlled, and the bottom one shows the baseline without hands. You can see the difference from this uh, you know the the scenarios if we have this. Uh, Hams and without hams with PV and EV uh, in case. As you can see, a lot of uh, a little bit more uh, kind of the oscillation around the mean value for the water heater. That's interesting kind of a phenomenon. And also for this water uh, heater and for this air conditioner because the water heater and conditioner are very highly controlled by this hams. Hams can adjust their input you know, constantly. So, so resulting in those uh, oscillation uh, parts over there. And also, if we look at this, uh, you know, this uh, total power of control devices in the hams in the homes only with hams, you can see a clear uh, difference right here. You can see still the top is, is the hams, the bottom one is without hams. You can see this can you know large oscillation of the uh, air conditioner control. So in this case, hams can control that with every uh, you know few fifteen seconds or so, could control very fast, and then. The water heater uh, have a large oscillation compared with our hands. That's basically uh, a little bit smoother than the other one. So this is also <clears throat> showing that the control, if we have very you know finite control here, so that may re result to this kind of a up and down, up and down quite a lot. So this is another thing that uh, we can uh, look into see, to see if that can re uh, will reduce the lifetime of the appliances and stuff. So those are things uh, basically we uh, interesting study we can look into over there. Okay, and uh, the next next uh, couple of uh, slides I want to show you from the system level. So from a system level, we can see that uh, uh, from this uh, you know this temperature, right? This is the temperature we show this from from home. Okay, you can see that the comparison of air temperature you only the uh, hams homes in the control scenarios, which is average simulated day. So the red line or the yellow line is average mean value. So it was also plot as 20%, 60% of those percentile, what's the you know, uh, you know, the performance over there. You can see those are kind of significantly pre-cooling right before this, uh, you know, before our uh, the, the peak comes. And then also, if you look at this uh, third column or the rightmost basically, a diagram you can so see that the average the mean room temperature has changed basically you can see that the red one is the non control and then the the you know yellow one is controlled so in general the idea is the hams is doing within the acceptable level of the home uh, owner the hams basically you know adjust the temperature 2.5 degree higher in those kind of time period in this case we can save more energy you know during uh, those times so you can see the you know, temperature difference over there. And also from this, uh, you know, level from the system level, if we look at all the feeders, tripping feeders, the voltage level without and without control, not that significant different. You can see maybe lung control is more smoother and the control, the kind of cases, the voltage is, is kind of oscillated because we turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off those applies frequently over there. You can see <clears throat> most of the time, the voltage is still with this limits. The only difference here is that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, you can see from this kind of a very light gray, about 2% of this, uh, uh, I think 2% of this uh, time or 2% of the, the homes, they have the feeders, the 200 feeders, they have this uh, experience over voltage. You can see we have ant limits uh, right here, you know, the, the dotted the green line. So whatever the voltage over, you know, beyond this uh, range will be this uh, over voltage issue. You can see that the hands control actually uh, uh, basically can <clears throat> uh, with or without hands control because this doesn't matter much. And they have this basically over voltage issue about 2% of the feeders. <coughs> feeders. This is because of the penetration or generation uh, from their their homes, so this is the case. Actually, we found that without or uh, without hams, there's still some uh, you know because the local PV generation, it's gonna keep pushing powers over there. So in those you know high generation uh, time period, the the voltages can go beyond this uh, you know entry limit a little bit. That's still kind of a issues. Maybe we can use some <clears throat> other maybe demand response and something like that. Uh, more share the energy with uh, the neighborhood to uh, alleviate this issue. So for this uh, uh, voltage stuff. The second, I think this is close to the last uh, slides I want to show is that uh, 
we compare the average cumulative cost of electricity for, for the homes with hams, because this is the only case we have hams and without hams. So the control cases, which is the blue line is controlled uh, with hams. You can see over time, you can see April 8th, 9, 10, 12, 11. So over time, you can see the cost savings is accumulated you know, over time. So this is basically showing that most of, of the cost savings, we can use hams to achieve that. And they also hams basically using this, uh, you know, pre-cooling stuff to reduce the power draw from the grid. In this case, we can avoid the peak consumption. We can reduce the cost for that. <clears throat> the last, basically, the uh, 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 figure I want to show is this, uh, you know, we compare the cost, right? Cost is still our, our, our key uh, you know, motivation. We want to lower the cost. The distribution of the uh, electric cost for those homes, for those homes with hams, you can see the cost vary because of variation in the desired air and the water temperature. We basically change every house, making every house different from each other. So between houses as well, you can see the variation in the house attributes. Again, the blue one is control case and the orange one is base case. So the expenses for homes with the hams are slightly lower. You can see if you, you just, uh, have a enlarge this picture to compare that. The blue uh, figure is slightly, you know, below, slightly below those kind of the uh, compare with this right, right figure with yellow figure. So the slightly below but not significant. This is our uh, conclusion. The homes that can earn incomes from the utilities. So if we have this um, large PV and uh, home energy, uh, home energy management over there. So. Uh, and also because those homes are taking advantage of the credit for exporting power during the peak price period by discharging their battery. And during that time, I discussed earlier. So we have shown before the battery uh, energy storage before, if we have hams, the battery is gonna write, uh, you know, charging, okay, before the peak and uh, discharging during the whole peak area. So in this case, can save, uh, uh, you know, even 2% of a penetration level can save the cost for the homeowners. The average cost, saving for this uh, hams homes is about 12%, okay, than the uncontrolled ones. This is the number we got. Uh, I think it's an important number we got from this study is that 12% of the energy cost saving for the hams in this home. So lastly, I just want to briefly summarize this paper. This paper is uh, focused on the applying the uh, energy. So we use the models and cost simulation framework and we develop the uh, stochastic HAMS model, minimize the residential customer thermal comfort and energy costs under uncertainty. And then all a HAMS model optimally schedules the residential appliances operating in the presence of solar PV. And then we have a co simulation work by leverage the IESN to have this uh, large system case. We have extensive simulation shows the valid validity of the HAMS model and also to quantify the impact of the HAMS and the PV and the EV to the distributing feeders over there. So, so with that, I think I conclude my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I think maybe we can uh, talk about your research and uh, you know, maybe we can inspire each other. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Dr. Wu. <laughs> Dr. Wu just gave us a presentation about the impact of MPC enable home energy management, management on large scale distribution system with the PWA. So the presentation is informative, informative and includes the, uh, the HAMS models, including the HVAC, battery, water heaters, PV systems, and, uh, and also about the, the uncertainties re representation, as well as the, for the, for the uh, HAMS system, there are a lot of uncertainties for the, for example, the, the HVAC load. The, the, the weather data, the PV generation, and the, 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 the low, the long controllable load, loads. So, and finally, the uh, Dr. Wu gave us a, uh, presented a co-simulation framework for a single house and uh, for multiple houses. So, um, it's a very impressive presentation. So, I, I would like to leave the time to the attendees. So, anyone have, anyone have, any questions to Dr. Wu? So please. So, uh, so maybe I, I would like to, to, to have the first question. So sure. Dr. Wu, 
Okay, so you just mentioned that with the ham system, uh, the 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 uh, the electrical vehicle charge is delivered uh, delayed is delayed, which can limit limited the limited the, the battery degradation. So, uh, but actually, I, I don't understand. Can you can you please explain explain a little bit more about how does it works? I I, I mean, what's the relationship between the the the, the charge is delayed and the the the, the, the battery de degradations? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's excellent, okay. Doctor. Uh, upon excellent question so uh, this is actually um uh, from my perspective so we uh, we we are as a modeler we just you know take the model and the model in our uh, you know in our hams uh, you know area here so there's a specific paper i can you know send you this paper so which is published by the, my coworker my former coworker andy hawk in national mm -hmm. renewable energy so while their idea uh, national renewable energy laboratory at the area over there what they are, have been doing is that they develop two terms. One is the, basically the capacity fade and the, and the, let me see, this is a bit longer term. So let's go back to this um, degradation cost. You can see the bottom one shows the valuation cost. So you have CQD, TS, CQSOC, and CQDOD. Mm -hmm. So we did a similar, some kind of a simplification. We ignore one term because for the short term, Operation that term may not change, but yes. we still consider the you know the capacity fade and the power fade. In other words, yes. if we have a more uh, energy in the system or a longer time in the system, the fade, which is basically the reduction, the reduction will be higher. So that yes. according okay. to their model, okay, according to their their work over there, and in this okay. case, we want to have the uh, we sit at home. We want to basically delay that one. In this mm -hmm. case, we can reduce the time. Which has a high SOC or has a oh. high the, the power. So that's why okay. in, the, in this case, there yeah, you can see we delay until the end because in this case, the system, the, the EV uh, residing in the high SOC or high energy parts, the time will be minimized, not yeah. as this kind of undid line. So, so in their model, they uh, uh, conclude that the higher energy fade, uh, the higher basically the capacity fade if the SOC is 100%, you know, all the time. So this is going to be accelerated degradation of the battery. So they, what they're doing is uh, when we I want to use the battery, we just charge it to a high. In this case, yeah. we can avoid yeah. that as the, the time, high SOC or high, high uh, you know, SOC, we can reduce the degradation. So this is your okay. model. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you for your explanation. <laughs> yeah, this is my just, uh, I'm not working in that specific area. I just like take the model okay. and model in my uh, stuff. So I will show you the detailed paper for that. Yeah. Okay, I will look at. Okay, I will look at your paper. <laughs> yeah, for perfect. Yeah, 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 okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the attendees? Um, I ask one question. Sure. Professor okay, Wu. please, Dr. Tang. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your presentation, uh, Professor Wu. So I have a, a question about uh, stochastic model predictive control. So I mean, uh, so when you use um uh, stochastic model predictive control. Uh, is there any issue uh, of computational burden uh, when you go for uh, large scale residential buildings? That's an excellent question. I think uh, apparently Dr. Tan is working in similar areas or something. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So we suffer this one, even we use the high performance computing because Enrio have the state of art, large, you know, the, the computing uh, platform over there, we still suffer that. So so that's why we have the MIP solver because the whole model is MIP solver. And then we have, uh, you know, scenario generally thought because we have four uh, uncertainty dimension. We can have like tens of thousands of scenarios for that because we generate that one. So what we have done here is that uh, two things. One thing is we reduce the scenario numbers as we mentioned here. So, that uh, the scenario reduction techniques, we use this um, uh, techniques to uh, uh, reduce the uh, scenario, uh, you know, the, we use a, a fast backward method. So basically uh, it's basically generated those kind of the scenario trees for this neighborhood kind of the scenarios that merge together. So in this case, we use that method to reduce number scenario. Another one is we are trying to do is uh, in some cases, we also that, uh, you know, trying to Use this scenario if you have, uh, you know, because model control is making decision for the next five minutes or next uh, couple of minutes. 
we want to reduce this kind of a time period for this one minute. So in this case, if one minute, we can have less uncertainty than five minutes. So in this case, we use the multiple control method to reduce the, basically the time, uh, we reduce the, the time resolution. In this case, we can have less scenario. So the core thing here is still, we want to use a less, less, less scenario to representing the all uncertainty in this case. So I think uh, uh, for the simulation, we need to have, uh, uh, for the one day simulation, for the 8,500 buses system, we still need a pretty much 12 hours for the whole uh, stochastic simulation for, for that, uh, you know, just, uh, just uh, uh, for you run one. So this is a simulation is gonna be run like for multiple days for this larger system for this uh, one, uh, the whole week. So yes, I heard you say yes, so we still suffer from that. There is, I think, uh, not a good uh, kind of the solution to, to address that, you know, as a, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or a million, a million variables for the MVP solver. Even you will use this uh, GAM or use this uh, uh, Groupy or um, Simplex, but the, the latest version, even use this in this kind of a high performance computing, still have this uh, problem. So we want to use uh, less and less scenario to represent, uh, accurately represent uh, the uncertain space uh, and reduce the, the, the forecast time. So the less forecast time, the more accurate forecasting. So in the two aspect, we want to basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, alleviate the computational burden of the MIP solver of this uh, scenario. So that's uh, uh, one thing. I think uh, there is, of course, there's another way. We are looking into other, you know, in our lab, we not only have uh, MIP, we also have uh, auto, uh, ADP, which is uh, approximate or adaptive program programming, uh, uh, programming <coughs> dynamic programming. So basically, that's another way of looking into this uh, decision making uh, Markov chain decision process here. So that one uh, with a certain kind of uh, you know the you know setting over there uh, is gonna compute much faster than the MIP uh, one. So this is the work we have done separately from the joint project. But I can show you some results. We compare this MIP compare with this uh, uh, ADP uh, in different settings. We find that. You know, in a large number of scenario cases or in large uncertainty cases, the ADP definitely outperforms the MIP uh, in that kind of study. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Thanks yeah. for your answer. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Wu, there is a lot of question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Liu, Dr. Liu, are you, uh, are you there? Maybe you can ask the, your question directly. Dr. Liu, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yes. Say hi, Dr. Liu, yes. Please. Yeah. Uh, I want to know what impact of these large scale debug of the PEV systems can have on the large power uh, grid, especially in uh, large power grid, like in China, uh, especially mm -hmm. at the national or regional level, you know. Uh, a lot of researchers focus on the uh, just like the country or uh, communities. So I want to know if there was a more uh, large scale, will it happen more? Uh, what changes will it would it happen? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. Actually, uh, Dr. Liu's question is addressing several, uh, you know, recently DOE has a, you know, announced several funding opportunity looking to the large scale uh, PVs. So I think uh, right now, as far as I, my observation is that uh, the distributed PV is maybe uh, approaching the end in terms of the funding, in terms of the research. So TOE is more and more looking to the larger scale, especially community scale, looking to this agricultural scale, looking to utility scale over there. So I think the trend here, especially in the state of Kansas, where the university, my university is, we're looking to the large agricultural land. So if we have tens of kilowatts or, or hundreds of kilowatts of the PV panels over there, how that part is going to co-exist uh, with this agricultural crops over there, how the two things can have an economic, social, and uh, basically the environmental impact of the larger scale. I think uh, uh, the distributed PV has been in the U.S. for many years, and also the China, I know, the similar situation. The motivation of how distributed PV, maybe there are some obstacles. So the uh, income uh, the inequalities and people say uh, less of in incentives and also in the United States, the incentive is just retire for this uh, uh, for this PV gradually retire not this year but gradually like uh, reduce the percentage of the the tax credit. 
So those are things basically uh, kind of uh, give more momentum to this uh, utility scale of the of this uh, PV. And also in the US, the, there are certain areas. I think Kansas is okay, but uh, especially in the California and uh, you know those kind of sunny areas, they have advanced in the large scale and the uh, community scale the solar is a lot. So they have uh, pushed a lot of the state uh, government. They have the uh, you know. Uh, renewable energy portfolio. They have goals by 2030. So, what's the percentage of the solar uh, uh, utility solar they need to have? So, uh, definitely, I think the question is yes. I, I we saw this clear trend is kind of transcending to transitioning to more and more larger scale and the utility scale kind of PV uh, in whatever you know uh, you know aspect. And every uh, state has their uh, clear goals. Recently, they have the. Uh, goes over there. As also, you can see that the cost for this uh, DOE go, especially for this solar uh, utility <coughs> utility go is uh, yeah utility go is <coughs> excuse me is two cents because of the you know the uh, the you know the scale of uh, economic in scale right. So it's going to be more cheaper and cheaper and it's much cheaper and you know compared to you know the four point uh, six cents. In the future, so definitely we saw a big push at least in the United States. People, uh, the state, uh, the the community are pushing that, and also we have a lot of basically the funding opportunity recently, uh, looking to uh, you know how the solar uh, provide the resilience and uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, solar how solar is provide this uh, uh, you know energy green energy for the uh, agricultural land. So there's definitely I think uh, uh, shifting more and more to this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, utility skill. So I don't know what's the case in China. Maybe if the time is constrained, we can talk offline. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herdio, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wu. So the time is uh, almost up. Before we end this seminar, may I have a request to you? So can you, can you give us a, can you give us a uh, give us your email address or which had account if you if you have? So I think yeah, yeah, of course, yes, I yes. I think many of the attendees uh, would like to contact you in the future. Yeah, definitely. You're more than happy if you want to visit the US <laughs> and uh, you know here yeah. we're more than happy here. And then we're hiring yeah. students. If you have students uh, want to do the po uh, PhD or postdoc. At my university, we're yeah. more than happy to. Yeah, let's uh, have a collaboration. Uh, I think, yeah, just uh, I will show you my email. Yeah, address. show you your email address and uh, your WeChat account if you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, uh, uh, Dr. Pong, I just uh, text you. Oh. you. That's my full name. Oh, actually, yeah, actually, yeah, okay. I see. Yeah, it's very okay. easy to remember. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. No problem, no problem. Yeah, this is my pleasure to meet you guys and uh, looking for, you know, more work together and uh, looking forward to talking to you guys later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, hello everyone. Um, I have to finish this seminar soon. So, uh, I, uh, firstly, we, I, I would like to thank, thank, uh, thank again Dr. Wu for, for, his, uh, for a very ex uh, excellent presentation and uh, uh, please join me to to thanks Dr. Wu again, and uh, also thanks to all the attendees for your for your time. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, bye bye. Nice meeting you guys. See you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye.